This message is entitled, Enjoy the View, or Enjoying the View. And God led me to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. That, that will be the foundation of what we'll be looking at today. 1 Peter chapter 1, um, verse 6. But before we get into it, shall we just pray um, and cover this time in prayer? Lord, I thank you so much that you are willing, able, even eager to speak to us, Lord, that you have wonderful things to tell us, things that would bring comfort, that would bring peace, things that would stir us up, that would make us even uncomfortable, because we need that many times, Lord, so that we can grow, so that we can move your Love for us is filled with action. It's not lazy. It's not um, exploiting uh, of us. But it's filled with initiative, with action. And so we want to love you back in that way as well. Not spinning wheels for the sake of it. But filled with action, Lord. Filled with initiative to pursue you, pursue your will. So once again, we're here today to, to do that, to hear what you'd have to say to us, to be inspired by you, to be encouraged by you, to be made uncomfortable by you. Thank you that you are able to, to work all things all things in our life for good, for your purposes. Do that again today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So, is, are the images? Yeah? So if you put the first one up, please. Thank you. Views. Views. Uh, there's something special about a view, isn't it? Something, I don't know if you can... Uh, see the detail of this one. Uh, The light is um, against it. But this is a waterfall and the river that goes along the canyon. There's just something special about views, about uh, a display of a beauty like this. And when when we look at it, we find that it somehow it speaks to us. We don't know the place. Um... I mean, it could be Photoshop for all I know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there's, there's beauty in it. We find that it brings emotions in us. Um, maybe an emotion of, wow, that's amazing. If you move to the next one, you'll feel that um, it causes emotions sometimes of, uh, of freedom because you have such a vast space and you feel like you could just fly and soar through that area. Um, you know, you have the air and, and the, the ocean, and it just, it get that, all that space, it gives you a feeling of freedom, doesn't it? And it also can give you an idea or a feeling of peace. You can just rest under that shade and look at that ocean. Views are just, are just incredible, amazing. And it, they add value. You know this, because if you had that sort of view in front of your house, uh, you know how much your house is worth now, but imagine if that view was there, how much more would it be valued at? The view is, is pleasurable. It brings emotions in us. It adds value to lives, to even property. And it can be majestic. It can be of such proportions that there you are standing looking at it and you just feel little. You feel tiny in that vast space and those mountains and and you just feel that it's majestic. It should humble us. But ultimately, it's for our enjoyment. Ultimately, a view, all it does is it brings us enjoyment. It brings value to where we are, to the, that place, that point, 
where we are at that moment, our point of view is enriched by the view, but all to us. Or it can have the opposite effect. It can be a view that brings negative emotions. It starts to conjure up ideas of, I wonder if those were people's houses that were devastated by whatever happened there. I wonder if there was lives lost there, and obviously there were possessions lost, value that was removed in that situation. And you could have a view from your property where you live that can just be gray and sad and uh, unpleasant. And that removes value from where you live. And it takes away a bit from your quality of life because every morning you wake up and you're looking at that and you're thinking, I wish they washed that wall. I wish that there's a bit more brightness in that. A view can really mess with your emotions. It messes with the value of things in your life. Sometimes the view can be such that you feel like you're in a tunnel. (laughs) Your view can be such like as you're going through a dark tunnel. You can't actually see how far it's going to go. It's kind of um, enclosing you and feeling claustrophobic. You feel the opposite of what we were looking at before, that feeling of freedom and of peace. This is more of, a, of uh, the, the fear of the unknown, the, the closing in. So where you are at present, you have a view your point of view is limited or constricted by your position. But that view, as you define it as good or bad, it doesn't just depend on the view. It depends as well on your perspective. Now you can, on the left, see something... And it looks like that woman is very short, very small compared in comparison to that man. But when you realize and you move away from that point where you were before, you realize, oh no, she's not actually sitting on the chair. She's at a distance. She's the same height probably as he is. But the perspective fools you. So your point also is responsible for your enjoyment of your view. So your view has value, it causes emotions, it has properties that are responsible for what you're feeling, what you're going through, but also where you're positioned determines how you're looking at things. If you look at the next one, you might even be looking it straight in the face and you still can't see it. Can you see it? What, what's there? Is it two old people looking at each other? It's two people playing music, isn't it? Can you see the people playing music? No? Not yet? Everybody? So you could be looking straight at it. And, oh yes, now I see it. <laughs> so, God was ministering to me about views. I was uh, driving through Dorking and um, uh, Rygate. I went to um, Catrum. And you know these pl- places where you go and you pass or you drive through and you see a different view every time you just go over that rolling hill or you, you, you come across that building. And, and you feel that you know, there's, there's more around the, the corner. And you, and you start seeing it, how beautiful it is when you get to the top of that hill and you can see across it like that. And then when you're going up, you're sort of expecting, what's going to be on the other, you know, when I get up there. And, and, and then you're going down. And, you know, it's always changing. That view is always changing. And God was speaking to me, that's just like our walk of life, isn't it? That's just like when we, when we live, we, we call it our walk 
because we're not always in the same place. We're always moving forward. Time is always ticking. Life is always changing. And so it's a bit like a road where you're traveling through the road and you have different points. And at different points, you have a different view. And that view can sometimes give you a certain emotion. As you're going up, it's the emotion, uh, emotion of expectation, of hope. Hope that you're not just going to fall off a cliff once you get to the top. That it's going to continue. The road is going to continue. When you're going down, it's you know, maybe vertigo. It's, you know, oh, this is very fast. This is very steep. And you're just looking down. And, but when you're on the top, you have the panoramic view. So life has those different points throughout. And they give you a different view, a different perspective. But God is sovereign over that. Because that little road that you just saw, can you see it now? No. God is able and sovereign over all that you go through. So all these points, sometimes we magnify the road that we're on so much. We magnify the point at where, that we're at so much that we forget that there is so much more than that point, at that stage, in that season, at that moment. The view that you have from there is your view. It has value. It is important. It is messing with your emotion. It is making you live in a certain way. But you're at that moment in that place. You'll never be there again. You might be in a very similar place, but just like the road, you keep moving onwards. There's no roundabouts in life. You might feel like you're stuck in a roundabout, but the truth is time doesn't go back. Time doesn't go back. You know, the 40 years in the wilderness, it wasn't like they were paused for 40 years. They were kept from going to where they were promised to go, but they kept living. And they ended up finishing their life there. Time doesn't go back. There's no roundabouts. There's no U-turns. It keeps going. And, and you, might be, you might feel like you're in the same point again, but you're just in a very similar one to where you've been before. But you're always moving forward. But knowing that God is sovereign over all that, not just that He sees it, but that He cares. Yes, He sees it all. The point where you are, the point where you've been, the point where you'll be. But He cares for every single one of those points. And he cares about how you see, how you view things from the point where you are. He doesn't just know and see. He cares. He sympathizes. He sympathizes with what you're going through at what point you are at the moment. So God was ministering to me about these things, and he reminded me of, uh, of 1 Peter. So if we could... Turn there, please. First Peter. And although our foundation is verse 6, um, I am of the belief that it is a very dangerous thing to take a verse out of context. And I wouldn't want to do that to you. So, I want to put this verse in the context that it is in um, so that we can see the bigger picture. So starting at verse 3 and going on to the first sentence of verse 8, it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. By the way, if you don't have a Bible, sorry that I started reading before I said this, if you don't have a Bible, could you raise your hand it's just so someone can give you one? Don't be shy. You need a Bible. Everybody has a Bible? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. 
I just, I'm insisting on this just because it's so important that you see it for yourselves, that you don't, don't just take my, my word for it. I might be reading from a completely different book, you know, and you don't know. A cartoon, you know, something like that. So, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept, that's you, who are kept by the power of God, through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Our foundational verse. In this you greatly rejoice. In this what? In this faith, in this salvation through faith. Not this faith, this salvation through faith. In this you greatly rejoice. Through now, though now, though now, for a little while, if need be, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Let's stop there. You see, the context of verse 6 is crucial because it is important that we see the context of our walk of life. There's two, two ways to walk through this life. It's with God or against God. There's no middle ground. There's no middle ground. You either are at peace with God or you are under God's judgment. There's no in-between. There is absolutely no in-between. It doesn't matter if you're a religious person, not a religious person. That is the reality, the truth. At peace with God, under God's judgment. And so he's talking here, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So who has, according to his abundant mercy, begotten us to a, a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. God the Father, through his Son Jesus Christ, has begotten us. So birthed us, given us life, but it says that he has done it again. In other words, he is saying that he, we are born again. Blessed be God who has allowed us to be born again. How are we born again? We're born again in Christ. Because he, it says, was resurrected from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you and for me. So this is what he is praising God for. And blessing God for the fact that we are saved, we are born again, we are in Christ. So he's talking about a, a, a walk, not just a walk of life, but a walk of faith. And in this walk of faith, we are walking under the assurance of our salvation. Because it says that he has saved us into an incorruptible, undefiled, and that does not fade away. Does that sound temporal to you? Does that sound like it's going to suddenly be snatched, broken, undone? No. God has done it so that it is incorruptible, undefiled, that it doesn't fade away. It's reserved. And more, in verse 5 he says, You are kept by the power of God. Not by your power. Not by the power of your faith. Not by how sincere your faith is, or how strong or how big. Not by the amount of deeds. All those things can be important in their place, but the keeping of your salvation is by the power of God and the power of God alone. We have a responsibility. We have a walk of faith. 
but it's God who keeps our salvation, who he already made as incorruptible, undefiled, that does not fade away and is reserved for us. So what walk of faith is it? It's one that is filled with assurance, the assurance of God, that God doesn't make rubbish, that he doesn't make something that gets broken afterwards, and that he keeps us. So then we come into verse 6, when it says, in this. In this what? What I just said. You see? Now verse 6 has a different dimension. It talks now, in this. In this what? In this salvation that you have. In this assurance that you have. In this, you greatly rejoice. Of course. Though. So though, as a contrast. Though, but. For a little while. Not forever. Not ongoing for a long, long, long period. For a little while. If need be. If necessary. You have been grieved by various trials. Now we've been going through um, Genesis. And we could take Abraham's life, for example. And see if it. If this makes sense in his life, it says that he was, well, it says that us or he, anybody, would be grieved by various trials. That the genuineness of our faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, although tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Was Abraham's life like that? Well, Abraham was, was brought from from a land, next one. Went to sleep. It's coming. Abraham was brought from a land, which is um, what we know as Babylon, uh, Ur. And it, it wasn't that things there were very, uh, you know, dry and, uh, and, and there was poverty or anything like that. No, he came from a land where there was plenty. He came from a place where there were riches. Well, he came from a place where there was a lot of idolatry, there was a lot of commerce, there was a lot of culture. And from that place that he came from, he, well, where, where he was, I mean, God called him. So he was in this place and he was called by God. And God called him for what? He called him for a walk of faith. He said, come, come walk with me. Come have this walk of faith. And he went by faith. At that stage, he was going up the hill. Uh, he thought, well, you know, this is, uh, I'm not in the bad place, but this is God speaking to me. And yeah, I want to go. I don't know what, what made him go. We don't know. But he, he made that decision and he said, okay, I'm going to follow. And as he did, and he was going up that hill, he couldn't see across the hill. He couldn't see across the top. So he was filled with expectation coming from a place like that, but he was filled with expectation. What am I going to find? What's going to be up there when I get there? And as he got there, he saw, well, okay, there's potential. Um... You know, there's, there's animals, there's places to plant, but there's people here already. There's shepherds for these animals. There's people that are farming these lands or protecting these lands. And God is promising me something, but the promises that he's given me aren't just, you know, you don't need to do anything. You just grab it and it's yours. It wasn't like that. Remember, he was sent to a land that were, was inhabited by people already. And the people that he found there was a people that wasn't necessarily very friendly to, to others who wanted to just take over. He went into a place, if you remember that we've gone through in the few last chapters, he, he went into a place where he found himself in the middle of war, where he had himself to fight. And this land that he was there in, in, in taking, trying to take possession by faith, was already possessed. But he had to somehow struggle and fight, and by effort, the effort that was 
allotted to him, take it. But all this was done within a promise. A promise of a child. A promise that he would not just have to go there and do it himself, but that God would provide. That God would give him the place. That God would provide even his offspring. And a man of 90 to 100 years, the period between which he was called and then had the child, he was in, that, in those rolling hills, going down to Egypt, coming back, trying to work things out with a servant. Maybe I can have a child through, through her. Trying to work things out through lying and getting a lot of money for it and a lot of possessions. Having God's grace upon him, but abusing it to an extent. But at the same time, going with faith. Driving through those rolling hills with expectation. And then, as he goes down, with depression. Feeling that perhaps he has messed up. That he's not got it right. That he's just not worthy. That he's just not getting it. And then coming up again and God coming to him and saying, no, I'm, but I'm going to give you a child. I'm going to do it for you. You don't need to spin your wheels. I want you to work. I want you to wage war. But I'm going to give it to you. And all that is encapsulated in verse 7. That the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. You see, your life is, is filled with those things, with expectation going uphill, with a beautiful view when you're at the top, but then a feeling of fear and depression as you're coming down. But in all that, God is sovereign. And in all that, God is saying, I have, this is my 11 o'clock alarm, and all that, I have, I have power and ability to control and have my will be sovereign over everything. And the thing is, Abraham, I need that your faith proves itself. I need your faith to prove itself so that It can be seen as genuine and precious and for me. I need your faith to show that it's genuine, that it's precious, and that it's for God. And in this, Abraham with all his ups and downs, climbs and descents, top hill experiences and bottom valley experiences, he was being tested as by fire so that these would be found. Are we being tested? Are we going through these ups and downs? Can we relate to Abraham? I think we can. I think we can easily. But I think we can miss it. I think we can be so focused on the point where we are and the perspective that we have and the view that we have from that place that we can forget what's the big picture in all this. What is God actually doing in all this? Maybe thoughts of what am I paying for? What have I done wrong to deserve this? Why me? You know, those creep in now and then. And those are distractions. Those are just distractions. Why? Because this walk of faith starts with, in the context, the assurance of God. I am the creator of, or the author of your salvation. God is the author, the creator of your salvation. K. 
Can he make something that is rubbish? No. No. And he says he hasn't. He is the keeper of your salvation. Is he not strong enough to keep you? Is his grasp not strong enough to hold you? He is the perfecter of your salvation. Because he loves you too much to leave you where you are. You've heard this before, but it's true nonetheless. He loves you too much to just let you drag through life, crawl through life. What's the word? Survive. Do you find yourself sometimes just trying to survive? That's not living. If you find yourself surviving, that means you're still alive, that's good, but you're not living, you're just surviving. And so, from verses 8 to 11, let me read to you. He says, Though now you... I'm starting at the second sentence of verse 8. Though now you do not see him, you believing, rejoice with joy inexpressible sorry, and full of glory. Though now you don't see him yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. Receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And of this salvation, of this salvation I'm speaking, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what for what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating who he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. So, This salvation, you see, verse 6 seems to almost focus the attention on your walk of faith, on your point, on your view. But it's surrounded by something else. It's surrounded by something else that if it's not there, nothing else makes sense. Because if it is just about having faith, if all it is is about having faith, then faith is all you need. Right? Why are we impressed with this man of faith, this woman of faith? Faith is great, but faith in what? Faith in myself? Faith in my circumstances? Faith in what I have? or Faith in what? And so the focus in the first few verses, in the, the verses after that, is in what the faith is focused on. Not on the faith, but what the faith is focused on. What is the faith focused on? In this God, who is the author, the keeper, and perfecter of our salvation. And it says that this salvation, the prophets, verse verse 10, have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come. They were looking forward to this salvation. These prophets, these men of God, they were looking forward for this salvation that was to come. In searching what was a manner of time, the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would come. They were looking forward. What is, what is this salvation of God that he's promised? Well, this salvation is being watched. This salvation, which is from God, kept by God, perfected by God, is also being watched. It was watched beforehand as they were looking forward to it. And the Spirit of God was speaking to them. You see the beautiful work of the Trinity right here. Smack in front of you. Often people say, can you give me a verse so I can justify the Trinity? You don't need a verse. (laughs) Just go through Scripture and you'll find it over and over and over again. It says, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have 
salvation, right? So that's Father, that's Son. And then it says that the Spirit of Christ, that's the Holy Spirit. Every time it says the Spirit of Christ or the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ who was indicating to them beforehand of the sufferings of Christ. So here's the Trinity of work, this community, this God who is one, but in Himself a community, not in need of you, not in need of creation so that He can feel that He has a relationship. He is a relationship already. And out of the outflow of that love of that relationship that he already has, that it is perfect, he brings you into it. And so he says, I was testifying of these things, of this salvation. People are watching. People were watching even before it happened. And people are watching now. As people in your life that are watching, your family, your neighbors at work, they're watching. And you know what? The Spirit of God is at work in them. How? Because that's what the Spirit does. He pulls people in. He works in people's hearts. Don't you, don't you remember looking back at your life? How many times the Spirit was pulling at you? Things that He brought into your life? People that He brought? Things that people said? He was working. That was the Spirit of God. And He was bringing the testimonies of faith and of God's work to your view. God, through His Spirit, was bringing the testimony of His work, the work, the perfect work of His salvation, into your view. Maybe you had the wrong perspective at the time. Maybe all you were focusing on was that steep hill you were descending. But he was bringing those testimonies into your view. In verse 12, are you still with me? Verse 12, To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit, there it is again, sent from heaven. And, and, and listen, listen, listen. Things which angels desire to look into. Boom. Right? So, the, the people are watching from before, forward, of this salvation that is to come, of the work that God is going to do. People are watching now in your lives. People will, walk, will watch from after, right? So and so, when, when he was around, when she was around, this is the life they had. This is what happened in their lives. People are watching. God is watching. God is sovereign. But who else is watching? Angels. It doesn't just say they're watching. Things which angels desire to look into. Desire to look into. So, question. What things? First question. Second question. Look into? Desire to look into? Why? Why? So, first question. What things? What would you say? Us? So, angels are up there, okay? I don't know what your definition of an angel is, but an angel is a spiritual being that God created with no sin, incredibly powerful. I mean, there's accounts of angels doing incredible things. Not God, but still a spiritual being. To the, who minister to God, who serve God, who can see God face to face. Okay? So this is how amazing an angel is. And so the text is saying that the, the angels are things that they're looking at, that they're desiring to look at. What things? Us? Come on. 
Us? <laughs> Us stumbling around? Us with our issues and rejecting God, who, who is the, the best thing anyone could ever have in their life for years and years? Ruining ourselves in our lives? Losing at every second a bit more of what we think is all we have, our health, our possessions, our joy, our circumstances. We leave it, leave, leave it behind and we lose it at every second. And yet we think that's the most important thing we have. And we reject God. It, it, so angels are looking at us because we're so special to look at. No. He's been talking about this salvation, hasn't he? That's the thing. That's the thing that the angels are looking at. This salvation. And you say, well, why? What's so special about this salvation? Because they're angels, right? They know God, so why would it be special for them? Well, think about it. Who did Christ die for? Not the angels. Who did God, to whom did God do all these things? To, to whom is God showing a beautiful display of his love? The depth, the dimension of, of his love, that he would do anything, anything to have us for him. Is it, is it to the angels he's doing this? No, it's to us. We have a unique, a unique relationship with God. We have a unique relationship with God. And so the angels are looking down, not at us, but at what God is doing. At what God is doing in our lives. How He loves us, how He cares for us, how He comes down to our circumstance, how our situation, our point. And in our point, our view sometimes is great. Dana? Our view in the point where we are sometimes is great. And I had a great view on that day. It was a view of a new life, a view of the beginning of something. It was, it was a bad view at the same time. It was a view of letting go of everything that I knew, of everything that I now could see was sin and bad, where my friends and family were indulged in. It was a point that was precious, but the view that I had from it wasn't just one. It was of several, several angles, different angles. I had a beautiful view on that day. It was the view of a new relationship with all that it entailed, the struggles and the blessings. And in that view, it was, it was beautiful, it was exciting, but there was an underlying indication and warning, this is going to be a challenge. You're entering into a commitment. It's not just a, for your enjoyment. It's a commitment. Make sure you're strong in that commitment. And, and then we had the enjoyment of that commitment. The enjoyment of that relationship. And the view is beautiful when you're in that place, isn't it? The view, literally, the view is beautiful when you're in that place. When you're on the top of that hill. And it continues to be beautiful as you move on to expand in that commitment. And you bring a child into this world. And all those things are exciting and beautiful. And, and the point of view is great. And then the view changes. Because now you need to struggle with some things. Now you need to be brought to a place where what has changed? It's the location of your road, of where you are. Your point has changed. And you're 
led to look at it from where you are. And what can you see but what's in front of you? It's hard. You have to deal with it. You have to have faith that God is working, that God is doing something. And so when you start having faith that God is doing, that God is working, then suddenly, what is my view from this point? Is this the only view that I can have? No. Because God is still at work. Because God is still sovereign. Because my salvation is still assured by Him. It's still of His authorship. It's still of His keeping. It's still of His perfection. So the view shouldn't really change that much. Though it's tested as by fire for a while if need be. And, and you enjoy it and you're able to go through it by God's grace, by His strength, by the fellowship of other believers. And you're able to have and see of the gifts that God has given you and be blessed in those moments where things are uphill or top hill. But the views shouldn't change that much when you're not. Because depending on what you're looking at, what are you looking at? What are angels looking at? What were people looking at before? What will people look at after? What are people looking at now is God's work in your life. It's that salvation which is of His authorship, of His keeping, of His perfection. So, at what point are you in your life? Think about it. At what point are you in your life? What is your point? What is your position? Is it downhill? Is it as through a tunnel? Is it with a horrible view? Is it with a beautiful view that you're amazed at, that you're just so excited with? Regardless of the view that you have firsthand, remember that it's where you are in Christ. It's where you are in Christ that should define your view. Because God wants to test your faith that it would show how genuine, how precious, and how for Him it is. How genuous, how genuine, how precious, and how for Him. So remember, wherever you are, whatever point you are, whatever point of view you have, the view in Christ is the one that defines you. It's the one that you should be focusing on. Enjoy the view. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your work, Lord. Thank you for the perfection of that work. How gracious you are. How long-suffering how patient. So not like me. <laughs> so not like me. Thank you that you that you give us something that is precious. Something that has truth to it. something that we can offer to you. Something that you can be pleased with. And that's your own work in our lives. So as, as weird as this prayer might be in our lives, Lord, I, I do pray that you would work well that we would not resist you 
that we would embrace the work that you're doing, that we would see the work that you're doing. So more than pray for our faith or more than pray for our strength or our ability, I pray for your work. I pray for your work. That is what gives value to where we are right now. Allow us to see it, Lord. Work in every single person here. As you know them intimately, as you sympathize with what they're going through. Speak to their hearts today. Encourage them. Lead them. Open their eyes. Open my eyes. In Jesus' name, amen.